species, and you see these changes, for example, in uh, teeth morphology. And teeth make great fossils, so we know a lot about the record of the evolution of our teeth. So if we try to understand human evolution at the level we're trying to understand sticklebacks and butterflies and fruit flies, what should we expect to find out? We should expect to find that what's true for those other species is true for humans. Some genes will have learned new tricks. Other genes will have abandoned former tasks. The challenge right now, right now, and available right now, is how can we tell what has happened? Well, we've got some new tools to do that. And one important tool is we've got the complete genome of humans, and now, just this year, the complete genome of chimpanzees, our closest living relative. And that allows us to do some comparisons and some contrast to say, OK, what's identical between ourselves and our ape relatives? And what's different? And what's the meaning of what is different? So let me give you a little bit of a snapshot of what we can tell so far by comparing our DNA with the DNA of chimpanzees. Gene number. We have really roughly the same number of genes. Now, I can tell you that in a few years ago, there was the expectation before the human genome was sequenced in some quarters that humans would have more genes than any species. After all, are we not the pinnacle of evolution? OK? Not only do we have about the same number of genes as chimpanzees, we have about the same number of genes as mice. OK? Again, the whole complement of genes is roughly the same between these different mammals. About 25,000 genes. Most genes have a one-to-one -one counterpart. What about DNA sequence? Well, you've probably heard a number like this. We've just gotten more exact by having the complete sequence. But 98.94% identity. That means only one letter out of 100 in our, in our DNA code is different from that of a chimpanzee. Now, that's a pretty impressive similarity. That's a really close relationship. But there's 3 billion letters of code in our DNA. So a 1% difference still says there's more than 30 million differences between ourselves and chimpanzees. Some of those differences mean nothing. Perhaps the vast majority of those differences mean nothing. But some of them, of course, are the very stuff that makes us different from chimps, makes me able to have this conversation with you and to throw those t-shirts out into the crowd. So what biologists now want to understand is what makes humans unique and different. Well, we can learn some things. And let me just give you one example. By comparing DNA, we can see some things that have happened in our DNA that didn't happen in the lineages of other animals. And I'm just going to zero right in on a little chunk of DNA code of one particular gene. And this is a gene that in other apes plays a job, has a job in building a big muscle, a muscle that moves the chewing apparatus of those apes. And in those other apes, you can see that the code is absolutely identical between them and absolutely identical with humans, except for where those two asterisks are. And where those two asterisks are, those letters of code have been deleted only in the human lineage. This actually inactivates this gene completely. And the muscle whose formation is influenced by this gene is tremendously reduced in humans, but not other muscles. Remember how David told you yesterday about the modularity of bones in vertebrate skeletons? Well, remember, the movement of those bones is controlled by muscles. Well, just as you have a modular skeleton, you have a modular muscle assembly. And muscles evolve their size and shape independently of one another. And some genes are devoted to building certain muscles and not others. This gene plays a huge role in the development of this so-called temporalis muscle that moves the chewing apparatus. Well, in comparison with other apes, our temporalis muscle is really reduced. We have, say compared even with ancient hominids like this guy, had a pretty big jaw. We have a really slender jaw. Our diet has changed a lot. We're not eating as much rough grain. We're eating meat that's been cooked. And the interesting consequence of that may well be that now that we've taken a lot of pressure off the skull of holding this mass of muscle in, which attached up to the sagittal crest here, and you'll see that these other skulls don't have a sagittal crest, that this may free up some of the skull to expand in other ways. So rather than having a thick skull for holding this muscle mass on the side of our head, our, our skull's a little thinner and a little larger, and we're packing a little bit of the old brain meat in there. Okay, So some consequences, one of the 
advantages of more slender chewing apparatus may be have facilitate certain aspects of skull evolution that were important. Now what I want to just leave you with that notion is that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to pinpoint meaningful genetic changes in the evolution of the human lineage and correlate those, those changes with information from the fossil record, with information from comparative anatomy. We're not always going to be, at, we're not going to have the level of certainty, perhaps, that we have when we study sticklebacks and fruit flies and butterflies, that this is the exact change for this exact anatomical change, because we can't do some of the experiments that would test that at the same level we could in model species. Nonetheless, these correlations are really intriguing, and they are no doubt signatures of things that have been happening in our lineage. So this is just the beginning of this era of discovery. This work is just able to be done right now. So you, perhaps, in the coming years, will have an opportunity to ponder human origins at a level Huxley could have never imagined, at a level Darwin could have never imagined. You'll be able to look at the precise changes that make us different from other species and even from earlier hominids and weave that into an understanding of our physiology of our anatomy, of our neural behavior. That's possible, but will you have an audience for that research? Well, maybe, maybe not. I want to take a few minutes to address the general issue of the acceptance of all this evolutionary knowledge in our culture, and particularly emphasize the importance of this knowledge in human society. Most polls conducted over the last several decades would come up with about the same ratio of about half in America, of about half of all Americans, accepting that plants and animals have evolved from other species, and about half of Americans not accepting that. So that's despite 150 years of science from fossils, genes, and embryos. And you've seen a lot of evidence in the last two days that's been gathered in just the last few years and it goes down to the very fine details of DNA code changes that have occurred, independent evidence from fossils, genes, and embryos. Well, let me call upon two of Huxley's grandchildren to address this issue. The first is Aldous Huxley. You may have heard of him. He wrote Brave New World. But he also pointed out in another one of his books that facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. And of course, the facts of evolution are being ignored by that half of our society that does not accept them. Now you might say, look, this is just a personal philosophical matter. This is just something, this is the sort of differences of opinion that we can live with, and we have to find some way to uh, accept those differences. I don't accept that. This is a, the denial of evolution is about the denial of 200 years of scientific work. And it's not a merely philosophical matter. Aldous Huxley's brother, the Huxleys were kind of a gifted family, um, another writer points out almost five decades ago that it is as if man had been appointed managing director of the biggest business of all, the business of evolution. And whether he's conscious of what he's doing or not, he is in point of fact determining the future direction of evolution on this earth. That is his inescapable destiny. And the sooner he realizes it and starts believing it, the better for all concerned. Our destiny and the destiny of the living things on this planet are very much dependent upon choices that we make and our understanding of science. Let's look at some of the choices we made in the past. Those choices in the past have to tell us that the endless forms that Darwin wrote about are not endless. When commercial whaling started at the start of the 20th century, the original populations of whales were somewhere around these numbers shown in the left-hand column. 100,000 right whales, 240,000 humpback whales. Those populations have now been reduced somewhere between 80 to 97 percent. Even with the moratoriums on whaling, some of which were enacted as early as 1935. So the large 